Hi everybody. My name is Bill. I'm the executive director here at Bennington Rescue. Um, and thank you all for coming. We're gonna have a quick recap of our 2023, um, what this crew did um, together um, in service to our communities. I have a few words from uh, some invited guests. Uh, and then the main reason we're here, awards uh, celebrating our partners and our crew. Um, and we know everybody's anxious to start their long weekend if you get one. Um, most people in the EMS do not. I know uh, many of us will be here tonight or tomorrow. Tomorrow's May Fest. <laughs> and I'm on sh I'll probably be on shift, so watch out, everybody. <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> um, oh, is it gonna go? There we go. First, we do want to uh, take a few moments to remember Tim Finney, uh, life member at Bennington Rescue. Um, Tim joined us last year here at our 60th anniversary award celebration that we had. Um, it was the first ceremony in, in a number of years due to those lingering effects of COVID and, and not getting together for a period of time. Um, uh, unfortunately, he passed away November 22nd. Uh, Tim was a dedicated member. Uh, he was an AEMT. He was a registered nurse, a ski patroller, educator. Um, and he was active with the Free and Accepted Masons and the Bennington Coral Society. His positive attitude and infectious laugh are greatly missed for anybody that got an opportunity to experience those um, with Tim. This isn't complete, but we'd like to thank all the uh, local businesses um, and sponsors of our EMS Week activities. The Bank of Bennington gave a generous uh, large donation to help um, with some of the things that we do for our crew members um, over the course of the week. Um, so please remember to shop local. Because even those franchises, they're, they're owned by local individuals. <clears throat> So for numbers, in case you missed it, on our social media, uh, this crew answered 5,684 calls. Uh, 4,709 of them were emergencies, the majority of them being here in Bennington, 95% of them are. Um, and we did 975 transfers for uh, mainly the hospital or our local facilities. That was a nine, almost nine and a half percent increase over the previous year. It was quite a year, um, and this crew um, learned how to do calls and the turnaround quite a bit. They also traveled just with the patient loaded miles or responding to calls, 8, 87,173 miles. Uh, you could go around the equator three and a half times with that <laughs> distance. <laughs> And in direct response, patient care or returning, so the time on task, um, you spent 132 days straight worth of work. Um, so about almost close to 40% of a year. Um, that doesn't include all the time spent checking ambulances, restocking, cleaning, and of course, documentation. <laughs> Out of our 911 calls, uh, one out of every four, basically there's no transport. And what does no transport mean? No, no payment. So uh, uh, most insurances won't compensate for non-transport care. So whether we're canceled or the patient refuses transport, which is the majority of that no transport number, um, we don't get compensated for that. We do send out a donation request to those that refuse care. Um, and we do get a small quantity of money back from that. But um, basically, a quarter of our emergency service is uh, kind of an unfunded mandate um, that we have to uh, deal with. All right, so we're going to have a few words from our community uh, and partners. First, I'd like to invite Greg Nesbitt, board member and photographer. <laughs> And as you see, a generous donor of all of his time, um, <laughs> photoing and videographing for uh, Bennington Rescue. Oh yeah, I gotta pass my mic. I gotta, I gotta forget that all the time. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Gregory Nesbitt. I'm a professional photographer, volunteer, <clears throat> and on the board of directors, as Bill mentioned, for the Bennington Rescue Squad. 
On a personal level, McKinley Street is hallowed ground for me. My grandparents' house, where my mother was raised, is right across the street there. Um, as a kid in the early 70s, when this property was still Dewey's lumber yard, I used to play amongst the barns and piles of old sawdust while my mom was working long shifts as an RN at the veterans' home where we eventually moved to and lived on base housing so she could be on call 24 hours a day. In 2017, Forrest Wayne, the director at the time, asked me if I'd be interested in some pro bono photography work for the organization. I jumped at the chance to support them with headshots and advertising campaign photography. From the very beginning, being around our crew members, I was struck by the dedication and professionalism and how much medical training and testing to advance and maintain the roles as EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics was happening when not answering 911 calls. But I was only getting a part of the picture, no pun intended. <laughs> In March of 2023, when Morgan and Bill reached out to me to consider becoming a board member, I was honored and to be honest, a little intimidated as I don't have a medical background. But Bill assured me it's better to have a diverse board bringing their own experiences, talents, and community connections. Now, having served a little over a year on the board and seeing the fuller picture of what makes this organization tick, both from the staffing and financial challenges, I have even more respect for the Bennington Rescue and our crew members who are literally at the front, at, at the front lines of our emergency medical needs often walking into unknown situations at all hours of the day and night and having to rely on their training in stressful situations to literally save lives. Our crew members seated and standing here either live in Bennington or the surrounding communities and as the motto says on the doormat over there, our neighbors helping neighbors since 1963. And like all of us, have bills to pay and families to support. Unfortunately, unlike the other public agencies, EMS organizations are not fully funded and the vast majority of the of Rescue Squad's compensation comes from billing Medicare, Medicaid, and an array of over 100 different private insurance agencies. And if you've ever had the experience of filing a claim with an insurance agency, it can be tedious and a slow process. Much of the crew's time after responding to calls is writing reports that often have to be flawless in order to pass muster for insurance claims, and often billing is held up for weeks and months if we receive payment at all. There is a misconception among some in the community that Bennington Rescue has a large investment portfolio and now receives funding from the town. However, most of the investment portfolio is tied up as collateral for loans to purchase and maintain vehicles and very expensive life-saving equipment that needs to be replaced every few years. And God forbid, if we were audited, by law, the organization cannot bill for services rendered while the audit is ongoing, which can take anywhere from six months to a year. The support we receive from our towns is appreciated and vital, but is only 8% of our operational budget. As Bill mentioned before, we had 5,684 calls in 2023 and of those, 4,709 were 911 calls, 1,246 were no transport, and 3,463 were transported. Despite, despite responding to a call under current federal laws, if it does not result in a transport, as Bill mentioned, to a qualified hospital or agency, we cannot receive compensation. As some of you may know, our congressional delegation of Senators Sanders and Welch and Representative Ballant have submitted legislation called the ROCKS Act to specifically address the gap in this compensation for EMS agencies nationwide. And as this legislation is mired, and as of now, this legislation is mired in committee and has almost no chance of seeing the light of day for a vote. As we all know, the inflationary pressures and costs for supplies, fuel, and goods have increased significantly in recent years, and maintaining supplies for our rigs have put an added financial strain on Bennington Rescue's bottom line. Some of our neighboring EMS agencies in Massachusetts, New York, and right here in Vermont have begun to close their doors or are in real danger of closing. And those that remain had the additional pressure to cover even larger areas for 911 calls. And while one-time personal donations, money from annual fund drives, and towns appropriations are greatly appreciated, 
it has not grown enough to meet the widening gap between what it costs to operate an EMS organization and what compensation, donations, and appropriations provide. Bill and I have created a video to get many of the points I just made out there to our community and surrounding area that Bennington Rescue supports 24-7, 365 days a year. I would like to personally appeal to my fellow community members, family, friends, clients, and anyone whose lives or those of a family member have been touched by this agency to please consider becoming a sustaining monthly donor. If you can simply give $20 a month or whatever you are comfortable with, it will keep us afloat in order to serve you when you need us most. Starting today, I will be making a tax deductible donation of 20 a month and I ask you to join me and please visit BenningtonRescue.org slash donate. Our e-services vendor is working to code a monthly donation feature on our website and it will be live soon. In the meantime, you can simply call and set up a monthly donation over the phone. Thank you. All right, now, now Greg's making me show the video because you all know how much I love to listen or actually watch myself on video, but I will, <laughs> I'll get over it because that's what I tell everybody else to do. Oh my goodness. There we go. There we go. Go Bill! Oh, no sound. See, you gotta, gotta restart. This is for high quality emergency medicine. Bah, bah, bah. Hi, I'm Bill Camarda, Executive Director of the Bennington Rescue Squad. The Bennington Rescue Squad is a the dedicated, skilled, and compassionate professionals whose mission is to provide quality emergency medicine and specialty services while promoting a healthier community through patient care, education, and public service. We are constantly working to serve and improve our community's needs. To do this, we continue to work to address our crew's need for wage support, sustain competitive benefits, expand wellness opportunities, and continue to grow our workforce programs like internship, apprenticeship, and education to recruit and retain EMTs, advanced EMTs, and paramedics. Being ready to serve the community means more than simply having ambulances. It takes thousands of hours to hire and train one crew member. Even if we are not on calls, our staff is on duty 24-7. After the patient is cared for, the call is not done. Crew now completes cleaning, documentation, and restocking supplies. Since 2017, ambulance supply costs have increased 60%. Additionally, they all now carry expiration dates. That means life-saving supplies and medications that are used more infrequently must be disposed of and replaced. Using technology like vehicle tracking allows us to respond more efficiently to calls and ensure safety. Crew members make the Bennington Rescue Squad the great organization it is. They not only respond to emergencies and ambulances, but also provide outreach and special services like our bike team for large events. That was before. <laughs> our ambulance driving experience. Safe ambulance training means starting in the classroom, moving to a cone course, then closely supervised driving. In 2023, we celebrated our 60th year of service and answered a record number of calls. Inflationary pressures have increased the strain on our bottom line. Despite these financial pressures, we take pride in the fact that we have grown partnerships with other community service agencies to better assist our neighbors in their time of crisis. Most of the squad's funding comes from insurance compensation for transport. One out of every four calls results in no transport, which means no compensation. Compensation is also increasing from insurance providers at a rate less than inflation. Our three towns provide appropriations just under 8% of our funding. We rely on your donations for the remainder to keep this around the clock essential life saving service. We need your ongoing support. 
please visit our page at www.benningtonrescue.org where you can now make a tax-deductible monthly donation. Help us continue to help you now and into the future. Thank you. Yeah, Bill. Next, we are happy to welcome Ed Woods, Vice Chair of the Bennington Select Board and the EMS Liaison uh, with our organization. Oh, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> loud, right? Yes. Um, I've been, that's been drilled into me since I've been sitting on the rescue squad, for, I mean on the, um, the Select Board for sure. So I'm Ed Woods, I am on the Select Board. Um, happened to be vice chair this year, and as Bill mentioned, I'm the liaison to the board for the Bennington Rescue Squad. So over the last year, I've had the privilege of getting to know this group of professionals that run this organization, and it's been an incredible eye-opener for me. So uh, it's not a surprise that there's a common theme here about funding, and I'm not going to talk only about that, but I might touch on it a little bit because I think it's important. So a little bit of history, though, first. Um, Organized in April of 1963, um, so uh, 61 years ago. Um, the land that we are on today was purchased in 1977. So this was an organization without a home for a long time. In 1977, from the first assumed owners, that was the Dewey family. I heard Greg mention that earlier. Um, and and. Interestingly enough, during the squad's first 35 years, it did not charge at all for the services that it provided. It relied 100% on donations, fundraisers, and that sort of thing. There's that theme again about money, right? Today, the Bennington Rescue Squad is funded by the revenue that it generates uh, by billing for its own services. It does generate revenue from the towns that it serves. I think I heard Greg say 8% of the operating budget comes from the towns that it serves. That's a pretty scary statistic, actually. And, and we heard a little bit from Greg about um, endowments. Uh, that sounds like big money, right? I hope everybody understood what Greg said about what those things are really used for. I had no idea the cost of the, these um, uh, vehicles, equipment, and these aren't things that are here because they were on a wish list. They're here because they're necessary. So um, funding, uh, critically important, right? Um, and the, the gap in my notes, and, and the truth is the gap in funding comes from those fundraisers and those donations that are so critical. That, that's why I think the common theme today. Um, Back to the history lesson, in March of 99, 1999, I can remember that. So I, I know I'm old, but it wasn't that long ago. The squad hired its first full-time employee. And then a couple of years later in 20, 2002, the first executive director joined, right? So this is a pretty young organization overall when you think about it, right? Um, and today, that group of paid professionals is, um, is uh, supported by a uh, volunteer group of folks that make up its board of directors. Um, <clears throat> you heard some statistics about call volume. Let me bring it to closer to now for a second. And this is the latest statistic that's on the, um, the BRS website in terms of the last month that was recorded, March. 427 calls in the month of March. <sighs> On March 3rd, there were 22 calls in 24 hours. Most of you were answering those calls. Like I noticed this half, and then there's some board members over there, some members of the public. You, this isn't surprising to you. But the numbers are startling when you think about what this group is able to accomplish. 
24, 22 calls in a matter of 24 hours. Amazing, right? So something else that I think we should keep in mind is that the rescue squad provides the services that we've been talking about, the 911 response, the emergency medical response. It also provides medical transport, right? We don't think of that in, in our sort of um, every day, uh, what, what do we have to pay for, right? We have to, we have to make sure that medical transport is in there. Um, community events, tomorrow is one of the biggest, if not the biggest community event in downtown Bennington, and I'm sure that all of you guys are gonna be on alert, right? Paying attention to what's going on. And then the ongoing um, education support and um, public outreach that you all provide uh, to the communities that you serve um, in, in an effort to um, obviously educate the public, but also in an effort to make sure that young people know what it is that you do so that those who might have an interest in, in pursuing this as a career or as a profession, they know how to do that. So I wanna thank you all for that, that especially um, additional service that you provide. I think it's super important. Um, that's all I have uh, in, in written notes and in, in thoughts. Let me just ad-lib ad -lib one point to the end, and that is this opportunity, um, for those of us that are gonna see this later, especially this opportunity to become a sustaining donor is probably one of the best opportunities for Bennington as a community to thank this organization and to support it and to make sure that it is available indefinitely. So Greg, Greg is uh, today uh, becoming one of those sustaining donors, so am I, and I hope that many more will. Thank you. All right, next, uh, thanks to Will Moran from uh, the Vermont EMS Office, Department of Emergency Preparedness. A very long title. Yeah, uh, yeah. Excellent. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm not going to talk about financing, though uh, I could certainly spend a lot of time talking about that, but I will talk about a little bit of history. Um, one, I want to thank Bill for the opportunity to come down and spend this part of EMS week uh, with all of you. Um, I had an opportunity last week uh, to attend the annual conference, the National Association of State EMS Officials, and this year uh, it was hosted in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't know if many of you know, but P Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania actually serves a critically important um, role in the history of emergency medical services. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the experience that I had there. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, right, and this is the 50th anniversary of EMS Week, right, the world was a bit of a different place, right? The United States was, was uh, in the middle or really sort of in the beginning of the, of, of the Vietnam conflict. And in, in the fact of the matter was, in the United States, if you got injured on the battlefield in South Vietnam, you had a better chance of survival there than you did if you were in a car accident in the, here in the United States. So folks in the medical community looked out and they were looking at what was happening and they were looking at patients dying here in the US but surviving on the battlefield. And they said, we have to do better, right? We have to take the basic and advanced life support treatments that we provide in the hospital and we have to push it out. We have to get it out into the community where these medical emergencies are happening and where these traumatic injuries are occurring. So in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they looked out and this was the idea of Dr. Peter Schaefer. Schaefer. Some of you may recognize that name as the person who's identified as the father of modern day CPR. He looked at, he was an anesthesiologist and he looked out and he said, you know what? I think we can train ordinary people in basic and advanced life support, and I think we can train them to be inside of vehicles and go to the roadside or the bedside and deliver basic and advanced life support so to change the curve, right? So to improve the chance of survival from injury or a medical emergency. And so they partnered with a community-based organization called Freedom House. So Freedom House was located in the Hill District of Pennsylvania, or the Hill District of Pittsburgh, which is a predominantly African-American uh, community, socioeconomically disadvantaged, and racially segregated. And they trained 
around 30 individuals in basic and advanced life support. The modern day paramedic was born. The very first paramedic to ever intubate a patient in the OR, where do you think it happened? Pittsburgh. The very first paramedic to intubate a patient in the street, where do you think it happened? Pittsburgh, right? Peter Moon, Mitchell Brown, Darnella Wilson are some of the founding members, right? It's the pioneers of EMS. Some other names you might not recognize. Dr. Nancy Caroline. Anybody use a textbook called Emergency Care in the Streets? I did, 1996, when I took my, my EMT class. Dr. Nancy Caroline was the principal author of that textbook. So when we think about the history of EMS, when we reflect upon 50 years of celebrating EMS, it's important that we recognize and go back to our roots and where did we all come from? And at the conference last week, uh, the, the, the our association took the opportunity to recognize the pioneers of modern day EMS. Mitchell Brown, John Moon, uh, William, uh, William Renovich, um, and several others were there. And I can tell you it was one of the most humbling experiences I've ever been a part of because I truly felt like I was in the presence of people who did great things. And they were ordinary people who came from a local community organization and they were physician and leader, community leaders who saw value in what they could do and they invested in them. And they changed the course of healthcare in the Pittsburgh community. They had a massive impact on public health and they laid the foundation for what all of us are now doing 50 years later, right? So for every one of you who've been trained in CPR, it was the folks in Pittsburgh who, you carry forward their legacy in what you do. As a paramedic today, and as the paramedics in this room, and the EMTs and EMRs and advanced EMTs, the folks who created the opportunity for you to be doing what you did today, they started it in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So their legacy lives on in all of us and for those of us who, were, who you know, uh, were trained utilizing a textbook written by Dr. Nancy Caroline, her legacy lives on in all of us. So I didn't know a lot about Freedom House before I went out to that conference last week, but I can certainly tell you I feel very much connected to that group and that organization. Um, there's a lot of history there. If folks have an opportunity, there's a book called American Sirens that just came out within the last couple of years, tells the history of Freedom House Ambulance. It tells the history of our profession that I would say most folks know very little to nothing about. And I can tell you, even when I studied Nancy Caroline's book, there was no mention of Freedom House in it. Um, so it's an important part of our history. So let's fast forward 50 years, and let's fast forward to Bennington Rescue, right? So just like 50 years ago, they were the pioneers in EMS, Bennington Rescue is also a pioneer in EMS, and for several, well, for several reasons. One, for the same fundamental reasons why it was important for Freedom House Ambulance to start in the 1960s is the same fundamental reason why Bennington Rescue and other community-based ambulance organizations need to continue to exist today. And that is because medical emergencies will continue to happen and people will continue to experience traumatic injuries in the field. And it's vitally important that they receive high quality, safe, and properly trained medical care, both advanced, both basic and advanced, in the field and prior to being uh, transported to a hospital, right? That's an essential component of public health. And all of you are part of, care, of continuing on the legacy that they started, and they've handed the torch to all of you. And I'll also mention one other thing. There were a lot of firsts in Pittsburgh, the first paramedics, the first intubations, right? The father of, of modern-day CPR, Dr. Uh, oh, one other thing I'll mention, the, the training curriculum that Freedom House wrote was the first curriculum adopted by the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration. Dr. Peter Schaefer was one of the founding members of the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, an organization that all of you are a part of, and me and Bill and others are a part of. So their history and their legacy lives on today. The one thing I want to mention about what Bill is doing here with the team, which really makes Bennington Rescue a pioneer organization is that this is the first organization in the state that has initiated an EMS-led medications for opioid use disorder program. No other organization in the state is doing that. So like, 
Like the folks in Freedom House who had never done something before, you are amongst the first folks in Vermont doing that. I had an opportunity to present the work that Bill and his team uh, are doing uh, to our uh, commissioner's office yesterday, and I can tell you there is a profound sense of appreciation for all of the work and time and effort that you folks are doing. So on behalf of the commissioner's office, I just want to say how much we appreciate all of the work that you, under, under the leadership of Bill, are doing, the community support that you receive, and we appreciate how you folks are improving the health and wellness of Vermonters, both around the state and forging a way for others, um, as well as taking care of the folks that live here in your community. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to speak with all of you for a few moments and uh, keep doing the great work. Thank you. All right, we, we invited all of our, our senators, or both our senators and our congresswoman. Um, they were not able to make it, but we did get some uh, words of encouragement for you. Last but not least, uh, Representative Mary Morrissey, longtime avid supporter of Bennington Rescue. My biggest voice. Of course, today I have allergies, so I'm losing my voice, but that'll be a good thing for all of you. Anyway, I'm truly honored to be here amongst this great group of folks that deliver services every single day in our community and region. You do an amazing job. I see some of our longtime folks who have now retired, but I'm seeing a lot of new faces, and that's a lot of encouragement. I know on the federal level, they have looked to add funding in, and we've been looking at legislation in Montpelier that I hope we can also pass to sustain and to help sustain what you do every single day 
which is life-saving. I live by the hospital, by the way, so I know the trips you make every single day. <laughs> Probably more than I want. No, I'm only kidding. I'm always, always when, um, when an ambulance goes by, I'll say a little prayer to say, hope that everyone's safe and that all of you thanking you for the excellent job you do every single day. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you do for our community and the community members here. My family has been touched also by you. And like our other fine two gentlemen that are going to go be a sustaining donor, I will as well. And I challenge my fellow Benningtonians and surrounding area to do the same. Thank you. And we honor your service every day, even though sometimes it probably appears it's taken for granted. We love you all. <laughs>
Our third partnership recognition is for an organization that uh, at first may not make sense uh, as a good fit for an EMS organization. Uh, however, we've built a unique system to extend help to those that may otherwise fall through the cracks. Their peer recovery coaches follow up on those with risk factors for uh, substance use disorders uh, one to two days after our crew sees the patient uh, with a focus on those refusals. So those that don't go to the ER and have an opportunity to get seen by a peer coach. Uh, they have that opportunity to interact with those um, on that individual's terms too. So it's at their home or wherever they may be residing or wherever they may be found. And it's a conversation, it's a yes or a no, and then maybe it goes from there and maybe it doesn't. And that's the whole point. Special thanks to uh, the Turning Point Center of Bennington for this first unique partnership in Vermont and Assistant Director Michael Kuser um, representing the organization today. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh. Now, now you have to say something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And my colleague, Dylan, here. Dylan. How's it going, guys? Do you, have a, do you have any good words for the audience? We're, it's been so exciting to work with you guys. And, um, you know, I think it's so important. And statistically, it's strange that, like, fully two to one of our caseload is alcohol over opioids and coke and all the other drugs combined. But with the rescue squad, it's 50-50. So you're really reaching those um, hard to care for, you know, members of our community who are really suffering from uh, drug use, so thank you. And uh, I would just thank say too, from going out, I run the outreach team and send people to do the calls. When we first started doing it, I was a little worried that maybe people would be upset about it or something. And you know, a lot of people just say, no, we don't want any help, but we haven't had anyone get upset with us. So it's been great. I mean, people have been really thankful that somebody is showing up again and again. So I'm glad we're doing it. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Lost my page. All right, now on to crew awards. First is a letter of commendation. Um, this individual had several nominations. One that stood out was from a transfer patient who uh, requested to remain anonymous. I had fallen in my backyard and broke my leg. I went to SVMC, but they couldn't do surgery due to prior hip surgery. So I had to be transported to Albany. Corey was in the ambulance with me, helping me to get my mind off my injury it was so polite, I felt like I've known her for years. <laughs> uh, she uh, made sure I was comfortable before they left. I was so fortunate to have met her. Come on up, Corey. <laughs> oh, I have to turn it around. <laughs> I'm not gonna make you guys say words unless you want to. <laughs> the next one also had several nominations. Uh, Trish is always striving for more within her career. She's always looking for ways to advance in her field. She is at every event that Bennington has, whether it be in uniform or not. Another nomination for Trish was from a spouse of a patient who shared that if Trish had not been persistent in persuading a patient to go to the hospital, their loved one probably would have had serious consequences or died from a pulmonary embolus. Trish Miller is also issued a letter of commendation on behalf of Bennington Rescue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting for clamped to myself already. <clears throat> Next, we were going to invite uh, Tom Langevin from the SVMC ED, but he got delayed on a flight transfer in. Um, but I have his words anyway. Uh, Alex is motivated, cheerful, talented, professional. She goes above and beyond for the town, her patients, and the EMS service. Alex is a motivated individual. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the work that you do. <laughs> 
<clears throat> who's continuing to pursue, pursue her education to better her practice. As a grumpy ER nurse, she does make my life better, and for that, she should be awarded and appreciated appropriately. Alex Zabo is issued a letter of commendation on behalf of Bennington Rescue. <laughs> Here, we'll come over, we'll come over to you. I swear they're happy tears. <laughs> I'm gonna make Morgan read this one. I'll even remember to switch the mic here because it's it's her nomination. Well, it says we received the following nomination, but I nominated <laughs> for our Rookie of the Year award. Isaac started with Bennington Rescue in October of 2023 as an apprentice. His progress through the program is demonstrative of our expectations of what the apprenticeship was intended to accomplish. Within five months, Isaac passed his national registry and became a certified provider. Isaac is steadily progressing and completed the field training and evaluation program earlier this month. This month, yeah. yeah. Also notable, <laughs> in March, Isaac was the top responder. Isaac is always willing to lend a hand. You rarely see him sitting around on his phone or lounging. He takes constructive criticism well and adapts to the ever-changing world of EMS. He's kind and compassionate and a proud new addition to our team. Uh, that makes the day much better. Tammy's very knowledgeable, compassionate, and caring, and has a lot of patience. She works very well with her other squad members. When she comes to our facility, Brookdale Fillmore Pond, she's very polite, respectful, and supportive uh, towards staff and our residents. Another one said, my husband had a gaping wound on his head and was bleeding so much we couldn't control it. Tammy and her partner were wonderful with him. He was intoxicated and they rolled with it. <laughs> <laughs> kind, compassionate, very caring. She explained every step that they were doing in detail. We felt very fortunate that evening. Tammy's involved in much more than Bennington Rescue and a part of our community in, in many ways. Congratulations to EMT Tammy Queen. <laughs>
<clears throat> this paramedic is known for her resilience, ab ability to receive uh, feedback, then integrate it into her daily practice. She has progressed rapidly at Bennington Rescue, uh, starting as a you know, late EMT apprentice after completing our EMT training program, then completing paramedic school. After becoming a cleared paramedic, she became an educator, FTO, uh, education coordinator, then on to lieutenant, and now field training and evaluation coordinator. She was nominated by our crew members with one crew uh, nomination saying, uh, Katie is always there when on shift. She goes above and beyond to make sure everyone feels supported. Although unable to make it today, I'd like to add that Katie has quickly become an integral part of our uh, Bennington Rescue leadership. Um, so, Katie gets medic of the year. <clears throat> Uh, lastly, we issue some awards only intermittently. Uh, these two crew members were on two critical calls where patient care decision making and support uh, made the difference for their patients. Their first nomination for care of a chest pain patient. Not only did this patient have chest pain, they were found to be having an acute heart attack after performing an EKG. The first nomination reads, that Sunday night, they came when we needed them. They made the decision to take my fiance Tom to Samaritan Hospital. They said at Samaritan, that's what saved his life. I'm forever grateful. Uh, just two weeks later, the same crew responded to a serious motor vehicle collision involving multiple vehicles, injuries, and a fatality. <clears throat> the crew provided care and made decision, uh, excuse me, decision to transport the patient to Albany um, after medevac was un unavailable. <laughs> we were unsure of the outcome. I was with them for that one. <laughs> um, Despite his significant injuries to his ribs, lungs, spine, facial bones, arm, and found out later, uh, foot, <laughs> we're happy to welcome Rick Davis, uh, his wife, Rachel, um, and to celebrate Alex Zabo and Aiden Walsh for life-saving award. <laughs> well, Rick say a few words now <laughs> after, <laughs> after listening to all this today <laughs> and getting to hear his story from the ambulance side. <clears throat> Wherever you feel comfortable. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Thank you very much. So, first off, I wasn't really prepared to speak here today, uh, but I, I needed to come down to see. Actually, can the, you guys come over here yeah. for just a minute? These guys, these guys are my support because they were, they were my support and without them I wouldn't be standing here today. And, and that, that I do know. So I, I thank you so much, you, you guys. <laughs> and just like to, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, I didn't really know what this was about today. And uh, Bill, Bill had reached out to my wife to s just to see how we were doing, and then I got the opportunity to come to here today, which is amazing for me. Um, and, and I have a better understanding of what the Bennington Rescue Squad is now. Um, I, you know, we, we had some history about about EMTs and paramedics, which was great. The financial side of things, which I think is something that uh, occurs in every business. And, today and, and even more so on this side of things because of you know the medical industry is tough and we don't have it but I'm standing here as living proof of why everyone needs to become donors everyone needs to uh, participate all that you can because without this I would not be here today and I can't thank everyone enough uh, glad to have, have all of you and uh, it was very informative I have a new uh, understanding of what this is all about, and thank you guys all so much. This is why I only do this once a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, with that, I want to thank everybody for coming out. 
Um, there's some good history stuff over there. Um, we have snacks and uh, some other stuff. And Morgan wants to say something. <laughs> Up. I just want to take a moment to appreciate Bill. I don't think that we could have come as far as we have um, in the last year and a half without everything that he's done. He's really helped build our crews up. Um, he's given you guys a lot of autonomy to help be a huge part of this um, agency, and he is what makes us strong. Here, here. I'm not very Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>